Good morning. Got a, got a couple announcements this morning before we start our worship service. Uh, on uh, November 18th, uh, the teens will be getting together to uh, pack blessing bags. Um, uh, they're looking for uh, the following items, water bottles, uh, small Bible, granola bars, fruit snacks. We just want to get about 100 of these bags together. So uh, any other questions on that, you can see Kyle on this one, Kyle or Tiffany. Um, oh, also, I'm sorry, uh, socks and lightweight gloves, too. So we're just putting these little uh, blessing bags together. And uh, like I said, we want to try to get about 100 of them. So if anybody can volunteer for that to um, just get with Kyle or Tiffany on that and uh, see if we can get that definitely done. So uh, Women's Day coming this Saturday. Um, couple things with that. Um, Real is looking for uh, a couple guys to help with the lunch on Saturday and try to be here around say 11 15 11 30 uh, to kind of organize to get organized that kind of thing too as well. James to um, get with him too as well on that. Um, also along with the Women's Day um, the women that are making soup for the Women's Day, uh, there's, a, there's a couple recipes out there and they kind of want to stay within those recipes. So please, if you're making um, soup, uh, please make sure that uh, you are making those recipes instead of uh, off the grid or whatever. So they want to kind of keep it the same. So um, any questions with that, please get in touch with uh, Tanya Dodd or Sarah Petrella. Um, and I think that is all of my announcements. Is there anything I might have left out? Okay. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Sorry. We got uh, <laughs> Derek Macon coming up here. Sorry. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so November is uh, Adoption Month or National Adoption Month. Uh, and so Colorado Christian Services is having their 27th annual fundraising campaign, which is scheduled for Sunday, November the 13th. And uh, if you don't know who Colorado Christian Services are, who they are, what they do, uh, they are a Christian adoption agency that has been supported by the Churches of Christ since its opening in 1963. Uh, they offer counseling, uh, referral services, and assistance to women in crisis pregnancies, uh, and also uh, offer an alternative to abortion. Uh, they are having uh, this uh, annual uh, fundraising uh, on, the 20, on the, I'm sorry, on the 13th of November. They do have a, an announcement, a pulpit announcement that I'm just gonna read a couple of uh, bullets here on here. It says the mission of the Colorado Children, sorry, the Colorado Christian Services is to come alongside women in unplanned pregnancies and Christian adoptive couples in building families through caring, experience, and professional adoption planning services. Through a special donation, your gift will help Christian service, Christ, Colorado Christian Services serve more women in unplanned pregnancies, caring caseworkers. Uh, come alongside and help, help them understand what's involved in infant adoption and assist them as they choose life for their babies with free parenting, education and support, adoption planning, financial support, medical care, transportation and housing. Uh, it is a, um, a tax, um, uh, each, I'm sorry, each monetary com contribution made in 2022 uh, provides a tax credit uh, for placing uh, kids uh, in families, and uh, it entitles the donor to 50% tax credit with state, with the state of Colorado. I'm sorry, that was a little bit choppy. How I was reading that, but uh, it is a, a a great cause, and uh, I will put uh, more information about this on the on the bulletin. Uh, there is a website. I also posted on the Facebook page uh, for. Uh, for the, those that uh, would like to contribute to that. Again, that's the uh, Colorado Christian Services that has been supported 
by the Churches of Christ since 1963. Thank you. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear and gracious and loving Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day you've blessed us with, and every day you've blessed us with, Father. It is truly a blessing to wake up in the morning and know that we're going to come and praise you and have worship with, with, with everyone here. The, the gathering of the saints is what uh, you definitely told us to do, Father, and it... Um, uh, we are just so health. We are so so thankful, Father. Father uh, would like to uh, pray not only for uh, wisdom, patience, and um, just all around, just um, our loving self coming and shining among others. Um, uh, we tend to get caught up, Father, in our, our uh, sometimes the world can, can dictate what we feel and what we do, Father. And I, I pray that we <clears throat> pray that we have patience, Father, with um, the, the things that are happening in the world. And I, I pray that we um, always look to you first before we talk. Um, the, the, the mouth can be sometimes a, a serious weapon, and it can get us in a lot of trouble, Father. And I pray that we always come with loving and uh, uh, loving thoughts and, and, and loving, um, uh, we talk in a lovely manner, and we don't try to um, damage somebody else or if it questions somebody else or even judge someone else, Father. We're, that is not our place to do that. And I pray, Father, that you give us that wisdom and, uh, and then that uh, and that patience, Father, to uh, know when to to open our mouths and when not to, Father. I pray, Father, for the the uh, this government and the things that are going on, Father, that we uh, especially the election coming up here before long, and we pray, Father, that. Uh, Everything is going as your plan, and, it, and we, we know that once we just give it up to you, Father, we know that uh, all things are going to go the way that you want them to go, and, and uh, we, we pray, Father, that we just don't have to worry about that, and we, we pray, Father, that um, uh, you'll, you'll go ahead and take, all, take care of all that and, and um, put everything in, in its pers own perspective, Father. Pray, Father, as we go into this worship service today that we uh, um, retain everything that we're taught and we, uh, um, we apply that to our everyday lives, Father. And we pray that uh, we continue to let our light shine and we continue to um, uh, have, a, have an answer for what we believe in, Father, and, uh, and to be able to teach and... Um, and just all around, give a good example, Father, for anybody that is wondering about Christ and uh, wondering on how to get saved, Father. Um, thank you so so much for everything and the, all the many blessings you've given us each and every day, our very own lives, our jobs, um, the, the ability to come and um, to enjoy life and to and basically provide for our families and... and um, uh, all around, Father. Forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings, Father. We know we fall short, um, and we, uh, we pray, Father, that uh, um, when we do fall short, that we um, come to you for forgiveness and hold heartily, do everything we can to change that uh, outcome, Father, as far as ourself not thinking the same way we thought before when we got into trouble, Father, and we pray that we can uh, continue to um, call on your name and, and uh, you continue to, to uh, forgive that sin, Father. Again, Father, as we go into this worship service, we uh, really wholeheartedly, we want to make sure our minds and hearts are in this, Father, and uh, um, n n no outside interference 
um, at this point in time, Father. We want to make sure that when we take of the Lord's Supper, that we're, our hearts are, are definitely here, Father, and nowhere else, Father. Leave that world behind. Um, it's each, 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 each instance has its own meaning, Father, and we pray that we don't let that get in our way in worship, Father. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God very much for helping all of us to gather here once again. Our first song will be Love Lifted Me. I was singing deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply sing within, singing to rise no more. Oh, 
if you didn't get one of the communion packets from the two baskets in the back, feel free to do so now as uh, we do not pass the trays at this point uh, due to COVID and continued concerns along those lines. Earlier this year, I had a little project I did in my basement where I tore out some carpeting and put in some laminate flooring. So I ordered one of those big 30 yard dumpsters to put all the carpeting in because it's just too much to piecemeal into the trash. So I kind of got done with that project and found out that I had some things in the garage I could throw in that dumpster, some things in a shed, stuff we weren't using. Still wasn't full. Pretty soon my neighbor to the west comes over and says, hey, uh, you got any room left in that dumpster? I'd be willing to pay it if I can get rid of some stuff in our basement from our kids when they moved out and became adults themselves. I said, it's already paid for. Go ahead. It wasn't near full. Out came chairs and tables and old toys and stuff like that, a lawnmower and things. Two days prior to pickup day, the neighbor on the other side came over. We just had our last kind of heavy windy snow we didn't get a lot this year but it was enough to knock down some sizable branches she says uh, I'd be willing to pay if I could throw a couple branches in that I said it's already paid for and it's not near full she was so glad so she brought all those branches over next thing you know we'd all cleared out our house and it just seems like we could all come up with more stuff we were looking to get rid of and I thought boy is that a picture of sin in my life I remember I was baptized in 1990 in Keflavik, Iceland, because like Peter said, be, repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins. And there was a lot of things I wanted to throw in that dumpster because I knew it was going to get hauled away. The longer I live, the more I look back and I think of things that I had forgotten about even before I was baptized, that those also went in the dumpster. And I'm kind of ashamed to say there's some things since then I want to throw in that dumpster still that I still want to get rid of. I've done wrong, and I'm ashamed to say that. But I didn't have to get baptized a second time. Jesus didn't have to die a second time. That one death, that one promise to remove all the sin, all the debris in our lives was sufficient. And at this time, we'll remember such a great sacrifice, such a demonstration of love for us in removing the sin past, present, and future from all of our lives. Would you bow with me, please, as we give thanks for the bread? Father in heaven, it does sting our conscience to know that your son went to the cross for sins that were not his own but ours. And yet, Father, it fills us with such joy and love to know that he was willing to make that sacrifice, Father, that our lives were in need of cleansing, of removing the debris, the things we've done wrong, the times we served self, the times we failed to serve you and kept our mouths quiet when we should have spoken. The times we spoke out of turn, Father, or just had things in our heart that were not pure. We're grateful, Father, that your son went to the cross to be the sacrifice to make atonement for the sins that we've all committed. And that we remember the suffering he endured in that body that he possessed on this earth to walk and to be an example to us and to finally pay the price for our sins. Help us remember his sacrifice, Father, as we do so as we partake of this bread. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow with me as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine? Father in heaven, again we come to your throne of mercy, being mindful of the shed blood of your son Jesus, Father, and how your word teaches that that blood continues to cleanse us every day from the unrighteousness which we have and which we commit, which we may commit in the future. Father, we remember the suffering and the shedding of your son's blood upon the cross. And even the color of it is uh, brought to our mind as we partake of this fruit of the cup, that we see his blood shed for us, the thing only able to cleanse us from all of our sins. Help us to remember the great sacrifice as we partake of this cup. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
having concluded the Lord's Supper, there's another command that is given to us to obey. Paul taught the, the church in Corinth and Galatia as he gave commandment to other churches to upon the first week, day of the week, to lay by and store. In the old law, there was a commandment called tithing where you could simply move the decimal and arrive at a number that said how much you were supposed to give. That law was nailed to the cross with Jesus. So what are we to do today? Paul had also given a command that there was to be purpose in it. The Lord loves a cheerful giver as we purpose in our hearts, lay by in store as we've been prospered. It's not something that we just say, oh, it's time to give, I'll think about it now. It should have been something we've purposed and dedicated some time and reflection into our lives, how we've been blessed and how we are going to return a portion and arrive at the amount that is pleasing to God to give back to him. Would you bow with me as we give thanks for how we've been blessed? Father in heaven, the greatest gift you've already given us through your son Jesus, Father, paying for the sins that we've committed. And above and beyond that, Father, you've blessed us richly in this life with homes and possessions, with food on our table, a roof over our heads. Father, even in abundance, we might look at how you've given to us and decide to return a portion to you that your kingdom might be fully supplied for all needs, that those in need might have a means by which we can distribute and assist others, that the work here, paying of the bills, the, the spreading of the word, all that needs to be done, Father, may be fully funded and accomplished and even allow us to grow and gather souls. We're grateful, Father. We give you thanks for how you've blessed us, and we pray that you will receive this from our hands as you have first placed it into our hands to begin with. We pray this in Jesus' name.
turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand up as we sing this song that we're going to have our Bible reading. <coughs> Oh, so are you weary and troubled? Chapter, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquities and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Nice to have you all here this morning. It's good to see uh, this building pretty full uh, right now. Thank you to the visitors that are here as well. Uh, it was a great time last night. Uh, we had a lot of people that were here, some visitors as well for our trunk or treat, some great costumes, some great kids running around uh, all over the place with sugar highs. Uh, it was exciting uh, to be a part of that, to be able to see that. I know Janice took a lot of pictures last night, so if you weren't able to be there uh, like myself, go on to our Inside Facebook page and look at all those great pictures of all those kids uh, with the smiles as well as the adults. Uh, it was exciting. Make sure you're looking out for our next date where we're going to get together again uh, in fellowship for our chili cook-off. Our chili cook-off next month here in November. Yes, we're already in November. Uh, crazy this year has flown by. Uh, and then December we'll have Christmas brunch. 
uh, and uh, white elephant gift exchange. That is always a fabulous uh, time to be had. Great food, great fellowship, and usually lots of laughter uh, with the gifts that are exchanged. So I hope that you will make a plan to be here. If you are visiting here, um, you are welcome at all those events. You are welcome at any time uh, that we, uh, you have an opportunity to be here with us. Sunday tonight we'll be here back again at 6 o'clock. We have Wednesday night Bible classes as well for all ages. Uh, Sunday mornings we have 9.30 Bible class for all ages and then our 10.30 worship that we're here now. So please make a plan to come to any of those and all of those if you'd like to. We are starting a new series here that is going to take us to the end of the year. And the reason why I want to spend a lot of time on this is because, as my, my title uh, tells us, grace matters. Grace matters. Grace is something that we need to study more of. Grace is something that we need to understand better. Grace is something that when we understand it and study more, we realize that we need to have grace ourselves. Not only is grace something that we receive, but grace is also something that should be given. And so we're going to spend some time here on grace. I don't think that the grace has been studied enough within the church or something within Christendom as much as it needs to. It is not something that is, stands alone, as we'll discover as we read, that there are other things that along with grace we must bring, and we'll see that in our, our, study, to, uh, in our study in John today as we go to the Gospel of John. But it is something that we need to make sure that we get, because it is huge as it, be, as it pertains to God and what he has given to us. It is who God is. It is who Jesus is. And if we are to be his followers, it should be who we are as well. Grace matters. And so I hope that you will see in kind of this introductory lesson why it is so important here. That last verse that we looked at in Micah chapter 7, 18 through 20, talked about while the word grace wasn't used there, it talked about how God is rich in mercy. God is rich in loving kindness. God pardons our iniquities and he gets rid of them forever, which ultimately speak to his grace. Grace is defined as something we, as kindness, as gentleness, as something, as favor that is undeserved. Favor that is undeserved. But that is usually kind of our, our unmerited favor we've maybe heard here uh, in the church. But that doesn't quite describe it in, in its entirety. There is much more depth to understanding grace. And so we want to make sure that we understand because as Christians, grace matters to us. It matters to God and it matters to those who want to receive it. So I want you to turn with me to John chapter 1, the Gospel John. <clears throat> John chapter 1. John chapter 1 here is, is, it is the gospel of John. It is John's uh, version of, if you will, of his story, of his account of what he wanted to explain to his readers, what he wanted them to know. And so in the beginning here in John verse 1, uh, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And so right now at this point, as I've talked to you before about this, we don't know who the word or what the word is at this point. If we, are just, if we are just now brand new coming to the Gospel of John, we've never read the Bible before, and we're coming here and we're reading here, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, <clears throat> the word was with God and the word was God. We don't know, if we're honest here, we don't know who that word is or what that word is. We know that it has a he. It says he was in the beginning with God. The Word was in the beginning with God. He was with God, and He is or was God. So then we're going to look, drop down here to verse 14. And I want us, uh, we're going to point something out here as we're studying here this idea of grace matters. So verse 14, that same Word there that is found at the beginning of verse 1, the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. Now what do we know about the Word so far? The Word was in the beginning right, was with God and was God. So this word has become flesh. As we read on here, just to get, we're going to come back to this point, 
The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory of as the only begotten from the Father. If you like to write in your Bibles or highlight, you might put down, if it says only begotten, you might put down only unique. Only unique. God has, many, has had many sons, Adam, Israel, us, but there's none like Jesus. There's not a son like Jesus. He is the only unique begotten of God. There's something special about Jesus. Now, I've already slipped and told you that it was Jesus here, but look at 15. John testified about him. John testified about him. Talking about him, we go back to verse 6, and you see that he talked about uh, this light that has come. Light has come into the world. He cried out, saying, This is was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only begotten of, the God, of God. Jesus Christ is the light in which John testified. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word that became flesh. He is the begotten of God. He is the unique Son of God. And notice that in 14 through 18, the word grace is used four times. The word grace is used four times. That should pop out to us and say, there's something important here. There's something important here about grace that we need to understand. Because John, in that short passage there, uses it four times. So this is where we are going to spend our time here this morning. So look back at verse 14. It says, and the Word became flesh. So the Word we know was with God, and the beginning was the Word, and was the Word was God. So God became flesh. It's interesting that he uses the word flesh. John wants to make no uncertain, with unknown certain uh, uh, terms here, what God became. God, here in verse 14, put on, listen, put on the weakness of man. God in all deity, God with all power, God who created the world and the universe, God put on the weakness of man. He put on flesh. And it says, and he dwelt among us. And what's interesting about that word dwelt uh, is it means here, he pitched a tent. He came in, he changed his address, if you will, and and came in and started living amongst the people. So he put on the weakness of man, the flesh, and then came in and and, and, and assumed residence with humanity. This is what God has done. God has put the weakness of uh, man on, and he has come and dwelt among us. We might be thinking about Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, it talks about how God, he said they called him Emmanuel, right? Which means what? God with us, right? John is saying the same thing in his terms. Here in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this idea of glory, what's really interesting about this is you see what's happening here. When he says he dwelt there, it means pitching a tent, right? So he put up a tent and then it talks about and we saw his glory. What does that bring to our minds? Anybody thinking about what's happening in the Old Testament with the tabernacle? The tabernacle was referred to, was was the tent, was a big tent, right? And God resided in the tabernacle. That was the place where God dwelt. Now, he's dwelling in the form of Jesus So now in the New Testament, for for this time, this short time that Jesus is on life, this is where God is. God is in the weakness of humanity. He has become human and dwelling among us. And when John says we saw his glory, what's interesting about this word that he says saw is that actually we we derive the word theater from. Theater. You know, like a movie theater. Anybody been to the movie theater recently? You know, you see on the big screen and you're looking and you're trying to take everything in. And what's neat about what John says is John doesn't call any particular thing in mind to the glory. It just says, we saw. And what that idea of saw is, is you looked at it, they beheld it, 
They, they took it in. They studied it. Jesus came, or God came, in the form of the weakness of man so that man could be with God. So that man could behold God before them. Where children could come up and sit on his lap. Where they could eat meals next to Jesus, God in man. Where there was laughter, where they saw Jesus weep at the loss of Lazarus. When they saw Jesus hurting from the inside out, knowing that he is going to be crucified. I think sometimes we forget that that is God, the Word becoming flesh. You see, when he became humanity, when he became flesh, when he put on the weakness of man, everything came with that. Pain, tears, but also laughter, conversation, eating, relationships. There is no greater way to understand, at least at a minimum, grace than knowing that God put on flesh. He became like us. You know, sometimes we, we probably all had those, those managers, those bosses that look down upon uh, the people that work below them, you know, and, and they don't want to do any of the menial jobs. They don't want to do any of the menial work, you know, that's below them. And so it's difficult to have a relationship with a leader, with a boss, with a manager who doesn't know what it's like to be working down here. And all they do is they send, they send stuff from uh, the CEO down to, I remember when I worked for uh, retail clothing, Nautica, and the CEO that we had at that time, you know, kind of rained from on high. And us managers would have our retail stores and he would, they would send us things to do to try to, to, to put into practice in our stores. And it's like, this isn't going to work. Are you kidding me? This is what you want us to do? This is not going to translate to sales. This is going to translate to busy work that keeps us off the floor from selling to the customer. It's ridiculous. But they've forgotten or they just don't know what it's like to work in the field. Well, guess what God did? God came down to the field. The Word became flesh. That speaks of grace. Why is that? Because as we continue to work, look on, look back at John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. We saw the glory. We saw God. We saw Jesus glorified. In what he was doing, he was glorifying in, the, in particular in John in the seven miracles in which he performed that John lists, although there are more. When Jesus was preaching, at the, the, uh, preaching the Sermon on the Mount, afterwards they would say, no one has spoke like this before. We can't imagine anyone that spoke like this before. And also the transfiguration, where Jesus there is up on the Mount and Peter, John, and James are all there and they witness... Jesus being glorified, and the Father says from up high, what does he say? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Follow him. They saw the glory of God in Jesus. And as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. What does John and Jesus and God want to make sure they understand about Jesus? What does he have? He is full of grace and truth. And here's what I was talking about earlier, where there's sometimes we need to focus more on grace that does not mean that we separate these two. Sometimes what can happen is people will separate grace and truth, and they'll spend all their time in truth and forget about grace, or they'll spend all their time in grace and forget about truth. You cannot separate what God has brought together. That's when the church says amen, right? We cannot separate what God has brought together. What has God brought together with the word becoming flesh? He has brought together grace and truth. These things are fundamental to understanding who God is. He is grace. He is truth. Later on, John, or Jesus will say in John 14, verse 6, right? We know this verse. What? I am the way, the what? The truth 
and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. But we need that grace to be able to come to the Father and the truth to understand it. And so Jesus, as he's coming and becomes, the word becomes flesh. That is so that we can understand grace and truth. Church, does grace matter? Yes. It's why God came down to earth. So that we would understand grace. That we would understand and seek His truth. That's part of why He did this. He became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory because God was there in flesh. We saw His glory, the only begotten, the only unique understanding that He is the Son of God, that He is equal to God, and that He is full of grace and truth. The next thing that we see here in John chapter 1, <clears throat> look first at verse 15. John testified about him, about him, that being the only begotten from the Father, that being the Word that became flesh. He testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I want to point something out here in John 15 that goes to our point again. In John 1 15, he says, And John testified and cried out. The word there, cried out, is an interesting word that is a Hebrew word for crying out with purpose. A purpose in being heard. Right? Do we ever cry out to our children with the purpose of being heard? And sometimes, you know, I'm not saying this just for my health, right? I'm not saying this so that I only hear this, right? And our children are like, what? Did you say something? Right? John is crying out with purpose because he wants to be heard. Why does he want to be heard? Because the message that he is bringing is the Son of God, that God is here among us and he has brought us grace and truth. It's that important. So he's crying out with a purpose. He wants to be heard. He needs to be heard. Why? Because this is the way that we can have a relationship with God. And he wants us to understand grace and truth. So then moving on to verse 16, where we have our next, next point of grace. Verse 16 says, for of his fullness, okay, well, what's that speaking of? Well, go back to verse 14. Look at the part where it says, the only begotten from the Father, full of what? Full of grace and truth. So verse 16 says, of this fullness that I spoke to you about, that has grace and truth, here's what I want to go on to talk to, just as, what John says, I want to go on and talk about this. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. What's interesting about this is the phrase in the original language says grace in the, instead of or replace of grace. It means grace instead of, instead of or the replacement of grace. So what does that mean? Well, it means when this grace here that we've received from God runs its course in the blessing that maybe we've received, guess what happens next? It's replaced by more grace. And then when that grace continues and maybe it, run, it runs its course in the blessing that we might have received from that grace, then guess what? It's replaced by more grace. That's why this translation says grace upon grace or grace and more grace. Some translations have that idea of grace and then more grace. But that is the idea of what is being spoken here, is God's grace is never-ending. It's continual. Now, is that something that we would want to be aware of? Is that something that we would want to know? That's why John is crying out to let everybody know about it. But how many of you have been in here in situations where you just wish... I just wish I could receive some grace. I wish I could get some grace at, at work. I, I wish I could get some grace within in my family. I wish I could get grace, from, you know, and you fill in the blank. And imagine the people that are outside of Christ that don't understand grace like we should and are saying the same thing. I, I just need some grace in my life. I just need some kindness. I just need some gentleness. I, I know I'm not perfect. I know I haven't done everything that I'm supposed to do. 
But man, I just like to get some grace sometimes. That's why we need to introduce them to the grace of God. Grace because it matters to people who haven't had it, who've never received it. And when they understand that the grace that they can receive from God through Jesus is never ending, that is continual, that should bring some peace to our lives. Some understanding. Grace matters because grace never ends. It is continual. That is the beauty of what Jesus did is he came here for us to understand grace and truth. And oh, by the way, this grace that I'm giving to you, it's never ending. Is that something you would like to have? It's something that we'd, I'm sure we'd all like to have and are relieved when we can receive it. And then again, as I've pointed out, we're not going to get into this much today, but then as we received it, we give it to others because grace matters to others as well. Notice here then in John, again, 16 says, For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law, speaking of Moses here, was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten, there's our word there you had there back in verse 14, which connects this all to, for us to understand that he's talking about Jesus. There's the word becoming flesh. No one, excuse me, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And so in verse 17, we have our third look at the word grace. And it says, grace and truth realized. And so we have there grace and truth, the beginning there, that Jesus, is the word is full of grace and truth. The only begotten is full of grace and truth. And this grace is never ending. It's grace upon grace. That each point that grace ends, it replaces itself and replaces itself eternally. And then this last thing it says, again, it brings back grace and truth together. Again, we do not want to separate Grace and truth, they work together. And here it says grace and truth were realized or made known by Jesus. The idea is Jesus comes, so Jesus is the Word. The Word became flesh. God dwelt with us. He took on the humanity and the weakness of man in order to make, us, to make known grace and truth. What do we know that grace and truth does for us? Well, grace and truth brings us salvation. Grace and truth brings us salvation. Now, the idea here is not so much to contrast Moses, the law of Moses, and Jesus Christ. Because we can look back into the old law and we can see plenty of times where God offered grace to his people, right? There's plenty of times where God, we're reading about it in Hosea, Hosea, and God is continually telling Israel, come back to me, repent, acknowledge your sins and come back and have a relationship with me. And that is an expression of grace. It's an expression of favor. And so it's not contrasting the idea that the law of Moses had no grace or any truth in it at all. Okay, But it's talking about the fullness of, the completeness of the salvation that God is offering. That the law could not do what Jesus has done. The law couldn't offer complete salvation. The only way that you could have salvation is to be without sin against the law. To, to not miss any of the commandments and all the other laws. You had to keep it perfectly. Which goes to the idea of the weakness in the flesh. The law was not imperfect, but we are. We make mistakes, don't we? We sin from time to time. We do these things, and so we could not keep that entirety of the law, and so the law didn't work because of the weakness of our flesh. So what does God do? The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and then keeps the entirety of the law in Jesus 
never sins. Jesus never sins. And then we understand that it was not God's intention for us to be able to keep the law perfectly, but for us to understand that we needed Him, that we needed a Savior, that we needed a sacrifice for our mistakes, for our sins. And so that is fully brought forward in the person of Jesus, in his sacrifice on the cross. And then you see grace, and you see truth. And you read through the Gospels. Guess what you see? How is Jesus acting to people? Jesus is going and he is sitting down with whom? With sinners. With people who are struggling. With people who are hurt with people who, who are looking for salvation, who are looking for answers, who are looking for what? Who are looking for grace. And they're not getting it from the Pharisees, the leaders at that time. They're not getting the grace that God wanted them to offer because of the offering that God had given to them already. But they're not receiving it. They're in this situation where they're in their sins and they know it and they understand it. But there's no one that is coming to them and being kind and being gentle and offering something that they don't deserve and they know they don't deserve it. But that doesn't mean we still don't want it. So Jesus is that example of offering that grace to those who don't deserve it. He is the one that makes known grace and truth. He is the one that makes known God. It is Philip later who would ask, hey, Jesus, just show us God and everything will be okay. Right? And what, what does Jesus say to him? He said, have you been with me this long that you don't realize who's here? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen whom? You've seen the Father. You've seen the Father. Grace and truth are realized through the only begotten, through Jesus. So God has always been about grace and truth. But His plan was to put Jesus on the cross to fully explain it. And to understand that it would take a great sacrifice in God leaving heaven and becoming in the weakness of man and being put on the cross and knowing exactly what we go through. Because it says in Hebrews that he was tempted in all ways, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Does grace matter? You could almost look at John 1 and say it's about grace. It's about the bringing forth of the understanding of what grace and truth are. It's about understanding that it came in the form of the person of Jesus. And brethren, last, last time I checked, I'm in need of grace daily. Are we not all in need of grace daily? And if we are in need of grace daily, who do you think else might be in need of grace daily? Everyone in this world. Grace matters. Grace is something we need to understand. Grace is something that we can receive. Hebrew writer talks about going to the throne of what? Grace. Brethren, I hope that as we start this, this series on Grace Matters, that you will take an inventory of yourself, think about the grace that you've received, and maybe think about the grace that you've not offered. But we're going to understand grace more, hopefully, in the next few weeks, maybe than you have before, because we're going to look at a bunch of different places that talks about grace. Because as Peter says, Peter says, he talks about how there is a manifold grace he wants this grace to be multiplied. And so there's different layers or understanding of the grace that we receive. And sometimes we receive grace over here, and sometimes there's grace that we have not yet received. 
And that's something that we need to understand because we can now stand in the grace that we have been given, Peter says, but he also says there is great that we, grace that we have not yet been given. And imagine the grace that you have now, and yet there's still more grace that we have not yet received. That should be pretty exciting for us and something that we want to share. Start on your own studying grace. Look up in your concordance in the back of your Bibles and look at the listings and the, the different verses that talk about grace and you'll see a, a different, even in those maybe five to ten different references, you'll see a different understanding of grace as they are given in those, each of those verses. But grace is ultimately what we are saved by. We are saved through grace. Right? Not that which we have done our own, but which that which we received from God. So it's interesting about the word grace is it also means a gift. It is a gift that must be received. And as Colossians chapter 2 talks about the same thing that Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about, in, in Colossians chapter 2 it talks about being raised together, being made alive being forgiven of our sins. All those same things are talking about, talked about in Ephesians 2, that we are made alive together in Christ, that we, are, uh, that we are forgiven of our sins, that we have been raised up. And Colossians chapter 2 tells us that he's talking about being immersed into Christ. So brethren, when we are offered a gift, what do we do with it? When you are given a gift, when you're given a gift at Christmas or given a gift at your birthday or something, we usually have no problem taking that gift, right? Because it's okay in that, in that form. But if someone were to give, give us that same gift during the year at a different time, we go like, oh, what? you didn't have to do that. You had to do that. No, just keep this and give it to me at Christmas and then I'll take it because then it's okay to take it. But if we, you know, we're not, we're not going to refuse it. We don't want to refuse it, right? We don't want to refuse that gift. The gift has been given. So what do we do? We have to take it, all right? I have been given this, the gift of sight with these glasses from Target for 12 bucks. <laughs> but if all they do is sit there, I'm not going to be able to read the small font in my Bible. But they're going to still be here. Here's the gift, James. What are you going to do with it? It's been given. Well, I've got to go down and receive it and use it. God says, here's the gift of grace. What are you going to do with it? Oh, I need grace. I need grace, God. I need, but I, I, don't know. I don't know. Well, here it is. It's there for you. But what Ephesians 2 and Colossians chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2 all talk about and Galatians chapter 3, they all talk about the reception of that gift, that action is response to believing that Jesus is the Son of God. To understand that the way that we are walking is not the direction in which we are walking towards God. We need to now start walking in the opposite direction that we were walking. And then we need to be immersed for the forgiveness of our sins. That's not something that man came up with. That's something that God came up with. Colossians chapter 2 says it is the work of God when we are immersed. And that is me picking up my glasses and putting them on and go, oh, now I can see. I now have the gift of that grace. I've been given kindness. I've been getting gentleness and I've been given the forgiveness of my sins. Grace matters. If you've not yet received grace in that way, in the way that the Bible explains it, let's sit down and talk about it some more and, and look at how what God says and what he's talked to about through his apostles and through his prophets. And then you receive that continual grace for eternity. If anyone else is struggling with grace this morning, maybe you want to receive it this morning. Maybe you just feel like you want to remember that God is always and continually offering it if you will just come to his throne and ask for it. 
you come to his throne and pray. And maybe you need the prayers of the congregation this morning, and we'd be happy to pray with you this morning and talk to you about God's loving grace that he wants you so desperately to have. Let us stand and let us sing. Thank you, James, for uh, another excellent lesson this morning. And uh, um, uh, what a blessing we have uh, in, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the grace that ex is extended to us. So we, uh, we're grateful you're here this morning. If you are visiting with us, we ask you to stay around for a minute and let us get to meet you. And um, um, if you could, uh, fill out a card and, and put it in the, the black box back there or give it to one of us. And uh, let's get to, uh, to meet you here. So we are grateful uh, for your attendance here this morning. And uh, we want to remind you, too, there are some bulletins on the back back there. If you had not uh, seen the electronic version, um, we keep those up to date as much as we can with all of our events and uh, everything going on. And, and um, so uh, take a look at those throughout the week. And... Uh, and uh, see what uh, we've got a lot of things going on and so that's a good thing and uh, that's the best way to find out so if there's nothing else let's go ahead and uh, and bow in prayer our Heavenly Father we we love you and and uh, we we are, we we realize how fortunate we are uh, to receive your grace and uh, your love and we're so thankful for that Lord, let us uh, also extend our, that grace and compassion to one another and to those that we uh, come in contact with, and let us always keep our hearts close to you, Lord. Give us the strength and courage and confidence in you uh, to do those things, um, to serve you in our lives. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are struggling with the things of this earthly life, and 
whether it be um, uh, physical health or, um, or emotional uh, strains, uh, Lord, and those that are suffering spiritually, Lord, we ask you to be with, be with those. Let us do what we can uh, to help comfort those folks, and, and we, we know that uh, um, we have hope through you, and uh, Lord, we know that uh, uh, we can always turn to you and your word for comfort and strength and guidance. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for the work here uh, at Parker that is going on, and we pray, Lord, that we will always put you first in whatever we do. Let us extend our efforts um, and, our, and our diligence to further the work here at Parker. Let, let us all take a look at, at our lives and what we can do uh, to help further the kingdom here in Parker. And uh, we're, we're thankful for this congregation. Lord, we thank you for the grace and hope and salvation only offered through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we pray. Amen.